Tick tock, time to rock. Good evening, good morning, good afternoon to everyone who's watching. What are we going to talk about? Oh, fine tuning. Yeah, we're talking about <laughs> talking about fine tuning of the of the cosmos. So one of the biggest topics anyone could ever tackle, we're tackling it right here. Um, so we are actually going to look at some clips from people who study these things more than we do. And keep in mind if you're uh, if you're watching, um, one good habit to get into is not to automatically jump on the side of whoever you know whoever side you already happen to be on in these discussions. But like like step number one, the 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 foundational step should always be trying to understand what the argument is, trying to understand what the uh, what what what's being claimed. And then from there, trying to understand what the responses are, like trying to accurately understand. There's way too much people, uh, way too much, uh, way too many examples of people not understanding arguments and then going around and talking about the arguments and either not understanding them or not understanding the criticisms of them and so on. So in recent decades, scientists have been stunned by the discovery that the initial conditions of the Big Bang were fine tuned for the existence of intelligent life with a precision and delicacy that literally defy human comprehension. Uh -huh, uh -huh. This fine-tuning is of two sorts. First, when the laws of nature are expressed as mathematical equations, you find appearing in them certain constants, like the gravitational constant. These constants are not determined by the laws of nature. The laws of nature are consistent with a wide range of values for these constants. Uh -huh. Second, uh, so, uh, go ahead. So there, he's talking about the fine tuning of the constants, and so what he's talking about there, like if you've ever seen, you know, the you know the equation for law of gravity or something like that, there will be a symbol like G, which is which is a num which is a number. So you'll have the you know you'll have the uh, uh, you'll have the the variables in the equation, but then you'll have a constant in the equation. And so there he's talking about the fine tuning that these in order for life to exist in our universe, at least life as we know it, that those constants like G in the, the law of gravitation have to be a very precise value because if they're if they're different, then you don't you don't get well so, so you might not get galaxies at all let alone let alone mm -hmm. life uh any thoughts before we move on ap i just want to make sure for anyone who yeah i, I just to... um well one issue that i that i take with with that is that it's kind of um a little bit misrepresented because when he says for example that the initial condition is um fine-tuned to such an extent that it is inco in incomprehensible to uh to humans to us i um like when I sit down and research uh, the you know this whole idea of fine tuning in the initial state of the of the universe, for example, what I get from uh, physicists from uh, other scientists is that um, it is very complicated and it looks like the initial state of the universe and the following states made it possible for us to exist in the way that we exist. But if it were different, if it were slightly different, it wouldn't mean it would be. Um, so it, it, it doesn't mean it would be impossible for any other state to arise and for us to then still exist. Um, what, what they would what they suggest is maybe uh, it would be different. And uh, if the initial state of the universe were different, then maybe uh, we would be different. We wouldn't be as we are today or the universe would be different. It's 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 hard to comprehend what exactly would result from a different kind of uh, fine tuning, as you may want to call it. They point out that if you increase the gravitational constant by a tiny little part, that uh, you know you 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 don't get you don't get any. Well, it, it depends. So on on in, in some of the examples, like. Uh, things would never coalesce into galaxies or um, the things wouldn't get off the ground in the Big Bang at all later. Uh, but but it, you, you, you tweak these things even slightly 
you don't get the large scale large scale structures that you seem to need for life. And what what Dawkins says. Keep in mind, guys, we're 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 non experts. Sort of looking at this. Uh, not a not a I'm not a physicist. AP is not a physicist. So we're looking at people who uh, have dedicated their lives to um, studying these topics. But yeah, um, yeah. yeah, what 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 Dawkins proposes in uh, in in some of his responses is. Okay, yes, if you increase the gravitational constant or decrease the gravitational constant, yeah, you don't have things like galaxies or something like that. Um, but what would happen if you increase that, but you also changed other things? Maybe other things can actually compensate for that. I don't know if that I don't know if that's correct. I don't know if that is a that is a reasonable uh, response. But I think what I think what Craig is talking about as far as um, some of the numbers. When you talk about the fine tuning, some of the numbers like the cosmological constant, they have to be so precise that I forget what the number is, but it's something like it, when when Craig says it, it's if it differs even one part in one in 10 to the 10 to the such and such number, um, then you don't get you don't get our universe or you don't get life. Uh, and, and I think what he means, I think what he means there, I'm not I'm not positive, um, but I think what he's referring to when he says that these are like mind boggling numbers, mind bogglingly precise numbers is that like human beings do pretty well. If we're flipping a coin, we say, what are the odds mm -hmm. that I get, you know, heads come up. Oh, one and two. Okay. I understand that. Um, you know, uh, rolling, rolling a die, uh, one in six, what's the, what are the odds of rolling a six, uh, one in one in six. Um, what are the odds of rolling two double sixes? Uh, if you're rolling two dot two dice, uh, you know, you multiply it one in six times one in six. So one in 36. Um, so we're pretty good at that. We start getting worse when we start talking about, you know, one in 180 million, mm -hmm. um, odds of like winning some lottery or something. And we're, we're, we're not as good at that. That's why people keep playing the lottery. They don't, you know, they really don't grasp the, the probabilities involved of, of winning. Um, but then when you start getting into like one in, <laughs> if you say like one in 10 to the 80th power, we're really bad at assessing those kinds of numbers. Uh, because keep in mind, 10 to the 80th power, that's how many atoms there are in the universe. So if you said one in 10 to the 80th, you'd be saying, oh, okay, one in 10 to the 80th. So it's a big number. Yeah, you know, it's somewhat improbable. Now, one in 10 to the 80th would be like saying, if I marked one atom in the entire universe, um, what are the odds that you would pick that one at at random? And and if you're talking about one in 10 to the 10 to the whatever, whatever power, we're, our, our brains don't do a very good job at even comprehending how mm -hmm. how impossible or how uh, precise uh, these things are. So uh, I think that's what he's he's on about. But yes, the, the one 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 of the responses that will have to be considered is uh, yes, increasing or decreasing some of these values. And some of them are much broader. Some of it's uh, 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 you know if you increase this by twenty percent or you, you decrease that by twenty percent, then you get some some important change. But some of them are 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 very, very, very precise. And any slight deviation would uh, mean that we don't exist. And so the, the question, the, the issue that AP brought up is, you know, similar to what Dawkins says, as far as uh, uh, what happens if you are able to tweak multiple dials. In addition to these constants, there are certain arbitrary quantities put in as initial conditions on which the laws of nature operate. For example, the amount of entropy, or the balance between matter and antimatter in the universe. Now, all of these constants and quantities fall into an extraordinarily narrow range of life-permitting values. Were these constants or quantities to be altered by less than a hair's breadth, the balance would be destroyed and life would not exist. To give just one example, the atomic weak force, if it were altered, by as little as one part out of 10 to the 100th power would not have permitted a life permitting universe. Okay, now th that that's an example. So he says if the, he said weak nuclear force, right? Mm -hmm. I think he said weak nuclear force. He said if it were altered in one part in 10 to the 100th power would not have permitted a life permitting universe. So two things there. One, this is, this is an example of numbers that human beings can't really comprehend. He's saying if you if this number were different one part in 10 to the 100th power. We think, "Oh, okay, so that's, you know, small chance, but there's still a chance." That's the uh 
let's do Jim Carrey. So you're saying there's a chance or something like that. Um, when, again, the number of atoms in the universe, the number of particles in the entire universe is 10 to the 80th power. So we don't do a very good job at processing those kinds of numbers. Now, the second thing is what, a, what along the lines of what AP is was saying, um, okay, if you change this slightly, what was William Lane Craig's claim? That you rule out a life permitting universe. And I'm not sure exactly. Now, now maybe, maybe, maybe these guys actually know uh, exactly why you couldn't have life at all. But it, I would be thinking if I were, you know, if I'm being critical here, I would be thinking something similar to what AP put. Uh, okay, maybe we wouldn't exist, but how do you rule out that, that any life, how do you rule out all life? Like life could be in a, a very different form in a different kind of universe. Uh, is that, would that be your thoughts on that, AP? I mean, there there are some um, scholars who have responded to this issue. Among them is uh, Sean Carroll, who also had a debate with William Lane Craig, by the way, I think. And um, he responds, and uh, others like, um, I don't know, um, Alan Guth and uh, you know professors of, of physics who respond to this issue with uh, that when you make this statement and when scientists make this statement, all they are doing is um, they are talking about um, if something was you know, changed in the universe as as it as it is, or if something was changed in the initial state of the universe of the Big Bang, then um, life as it is today would be uh, you know would maybe not come into existence. But the the thing is, the starting point here is we exist the the way we do today. The universe exists the way it does today due to certain uh, very specific, very precise standards. But that does not mean that if you tweaked those things, nothing else could have existed or nothing else could could exist. It just means um, the sta the standards in existence are required for our existence and for the current universe's existence as they are right now. If things went differently, something else could arise, and there is no way of uh, ruling out different possibilities. It is just that uh, humans cannot comprehend a different state right now. And then they are also just making, just uh, arguing about possibilities without even having um, the possibility, or about probabilities without even having the possibility to assess those probabilities, because. There are no other universes where you can actually, you know, uh, look at that. You can look at and say, oh, look, in this one, uh, this was different. Therefore, life didn't come into existence. I mean, the, the probabilities that we are talking about here are more philosophy than science. If I'm being critical about about the arguments being made, um, then, yeah, I would be thinking, all right, what happens if you tweak multiple, uh, multiple constants? And then I would be, I would like, can you, can you get the same thing? Um, and then if you say, if you say no, because for all I know, and uh, I'm thinking defenders of the argument would say, no, you're not, you're not getting anything like you. And so there it would seem like you're ruling out life as we know it, but what about the possibility of yeah. life as we don't know it? In other words, if you have a different kind of universe, maybe you get a different kind of life. And so just saying no life, again, that, there Precisely. may be the yeah, there point. may be a knockdown defense of that. In other words, I may be totally wrong right here. That, you know, physicists may actually be able to say, "No, you're not getting any life. You're not getting any kind of life at all." And here's why: I just why I haven't I haven't I haven't seen that, so I don't know. That's why that's why I'm asking. And maybe uh, maybe Luke Barnes and someone else can come on and uh, break things down for us. Thank you. Now there are three possible explanations of this remarkable fine tuning: physical necessity, chance, or design. Now, it can't be due to physical necessity because the constants and quantities are independent of the laws of nature. In fact, string theory predicts that there are around 10 to the 500th power different possible universes consistent with nature's laws. So could the fine tuning be due to chance? Well, the problem with... Um, so he gave... He said physical necessity is one possible explanation. And that's the one that uh, Suskind doesn't give. He gives a different one. But um, so I guess the claim here is that it, it had to be this way. It, it just had it, it had to be these precise uh, these precise numbers. There's no other way it could have been. And 
yeah, that that seems weird to me. And so the other alternative is that it's chance. Like it could have been a bunch. So he's about to go into chance. And like, it, it could have been a different range of values, but we just got lucky. You know, it's like rolling the dice. Sometimes you get lucky. Sometimes you sometimes you do win the lottery, despite the, uh, despite the probabilities. This alternative is that the odds against the fine tunings occurring by accident are so incomprehensibly great that they cannot be reasonably faced. The probability that all the constants and quantities would fall by chance alone into the infinitesimal life-permitting range is vanishingly small. We now know that life-prohibiting universes are vastly more probable than any life-permitting universe. So if the universe were the product of can, chance... Can you pause there for a second? Yep, yep. So um, he, the, here is the thing that I that my mind catches and doesn't want to let go. You know, what he just said, uh, that life prohibiting universes would be much more probable than you know, life permitting universes. But we're just talking about probability, right? We're not talking about uh, possible and impossible. We're talking about a probable or improbable. That's true, which, that's which... that's true. So so just, just, just to... Uh... Just to clarify, if I said, "Hey, you know, I just I just won the lottery," well, it was it was massively more probable that you would lose the lottery, but it's not it's not impossible. It, I mean, mm -hmm. I mean, it's it's not impossible for you to win. In fact, it it would be it would be stupid. No one would play if it were impossible for you to uh, to win. So there is a there is a possibility. So I think you, you're you're pointing out there that if you say that that our universe is one possible universe and craig is saying it's massively more likely because there there are so many more um ways the universe could be that would not permit life that um that i guess we shouldn't take it reasonable we shouldn't take it as reasonable that we got lucky that we just got mm. lucky yeah I, I would i would say just because it is um more likely that this does not come into existence and our state is, given the odds, considered by our limited knowledge at this point, uh, you know, con considered extremely unlikely. That doesn't mean um, that that doesn't mean that it, that it, it would be otherwise impossible for the universe or for life to develop. And you know. We, we, we're just talking about probability. So maybe we hit the, you know, we, um, we we exist and we have a certain bias because we exist in this universe. We look around us and we think, wow, I mean, this, this is, this is, this is almost impossible. Okay. Maybe it's true. Maybe it is almost impossible, but this is what we think because we exist. We have these functioning minds with which we analyze our existence and then think about the chances of existing or not existing. You know, we are the lucky ones, maybe, who think, wow, this is, you know, it's very, very, very unlikely that this would normally occur. Therefore, this must be very special. Okay, fine. Yeah, acceptable. But what does that really mean? Why can't we just accept the idea that this is uh, chance? This is random. This is how it occurred. And that's all right. I mean, I'm not, I'm not trying to dismiss... Um, the conclusion here that therefore there is intelligent design behind it. I'm just saying, I don't see how this is considered um, sufficient evidence to point in that direction. The strength of the argument is going to come down to like how improbable it is. So that's, that's one, that's like one big step and then mm -hmm. sort of ruling out alternative explanations because, you know, if you said, Hey, the universe, a, uni a life permitting universe is really improbable. Well, if you mean like one in a thousand, okay, that's, that's, that's improbable. But I mean, keep in mind, improbable, improbable stuff happens all the time. Improbable stuff happens every day. If you think about, hey, I woke up and then I did this and then I did that and then I did this. If you calculate the probabilities of all this stuff happening right there, that's pretty, that's pretty improbable. Um, so the question is, like, how improbable are we getting here? And, uh, to me, it looks like really, really, really improbable. So this is Luke Barnes. He's got his book called The, the A Fortunate Universe. Um, but he says, we have tweaked multiple, we have tweaked multiple constants. So it, we were asking the question about, uh, you know, what happens if you tweaked multiple values? And and that's that's just something I heard from Dawkins. Uh, we have tweaked, he says, we, we have done this. We have tweaked multiple constants. We do it 
in the physics literature. In other words, so I guess they're writing papers and saying, okay, if we increase this value and we decrease it, he says, but look, look, look how he ruins it all. We have to simplify for popular oscidences. Oscidences. <laughs> Luke, what's a what's an oscidence? See, now we can't even we can't even take your book seriously because <laughs> because you can't spell more. The odds are overwhelming that it would be life prohibiting. In order to rescue the alternative of chance, its proponents have therefore been forced to resort to a radical metaphysical hypothesis, namely that there exists an infinite number of randomly ordered, undetectable universes composing a sort of world ensemble or multiverse of which our universe is but a part. Somewhere in this infinite world ensemble, finely tuned universes will appear by chance alone, and we happen to be one such world. Now, wholly apart from the fact that there's no independent evidence that such a world ensemble even exists, the hypothesis hold, hold faces on, a on, devastating on. objection. Uh, Namely, if our universe is... What's up? Hold on. Um, so I, I, I heard the the multiverse explanation to resolve the problem of fine tuning before from other people, including, I think, from uh, Sean Carroll or others um, who mentioned that um, it would be a, a hypothetical explanation to such a problem. Um, but that doesn't mean that they are claiming that there is definitely a metaverse and this just resolves the whole issue. I mean, what, what they're saying is that this is a hypothesis which would resolve the problem at hand. It, it is one possible, one such possibility, and there is um, no evidence to 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 rule it out entirely. So, responding to that by saying um, there is no evidence of such a thing would be kind of absurd because you wouldn't you wouldn't be actually responding to the point made, which is that it is a hypothesis. Yeah, yeah and so. You basically have two different ways to use the multiverse because there, there are definitely there are definitely uh, physicists, cosmologists who uh, believe that there is a multiverse. Um, mm -hmm. But you, you 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 can you can be appealing to it in two different ways. And so Craig is just pointing out that hey, there's no there's no there's no separate evidence of a of a multiverse. So it's like uh, it's like he's saying that it's a cop out. But uh, I mean look. Look, look at the options here. You, if, if you're saying, hey, our universe seems really, really finely tuned for life. Um, and you say, well, what if we're what if we're one of a possibly infinite number of universes? If there's a possibly infinite number of universes with uh, variations in the laws of nature in these different universes, then there there would be one. Then there would be one that has that that's life permitting, or, or there may be many that are that are life permitting. And so, yeah, you can just posit this as well. If look, as a matter of fact, you can even do a parallel. You, if, if you're going to say, you could say it like this. You can say, look, if you're going to say, hey, it's finely tuned, maybe God. Okay, well, I can say, hey, it's finely tuned, therefore maybe a maybe a multiverse. And so there are two different ways. One, you could be just presenting it as this is a possible explanation for all I know. And you could, as a, you know, as a scientist, you could say, I don't know if there's a multiverse, but if there is, it would help account for some things. Um, or mm -hmm. you could actually be one of the guys who says, no, I, I believe there's a multiverse and no, I, I can't, I can't go there. I can't go there and show it to you because we're stuck in ours. Um, but, uh, but, but I, I believe that we are part of a, part of a larger multiverse. Is just a random member of an infinite world ensemble then it is overwhelmingly more probable that we should be observing a much different universe than what we in fact observe. So Roger fun. Penrose has calculated that it is inconceivably more probable that our solar system should suddenly form through a random collision of particles than that a finely tuned universe should exist. Penrose calls it utter chicken feed by comparison. So. If our universe were just a random member of a world ensemble, it is inconceivably more probable that we should be observing an orderly region no larger than our solar system. Observable universes like those are simply much more plenteous in the world ensemble than finely tuned worlds like ours, and therefore ought to be observed by us. 
the, here, here's one issue. Uh, even in the observable universe, um, the, the idea is that uh, when you generally look around the universe, there is there is a lot of disorder. If you look at um, most of the planets that we have discovered so far, most of the objects, uh, the satellites that we have discovered so far, most of it is uh, has no life, is not capable of developing life. Uh, much of it is just random rocks shooting across the uh, the, the galaxies, ac across the planetary systems. In our uh, solar system alone, there is there are a lot of rocks randomly shooting around. There's a belt of rocks. There are planets which serve no purpose at all, that have uh, no land to walk on, that are just a bunch of um, storms and dust. No one cares uh, about rocks, AP. Yeah. <laughs> and... No, uh, but, 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 but if, by the way, his... his, his uh, I, 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 I've heard him say this before. I think his point is, if as far as the sort of universes that would form, um, that our universe, this giant place with all this stuff, is far less likely to form than something small like our solar system. And therefore, uh, I don't know, even if you got something that's life permitting, it would be far more likely that our little solar system would form and we would get, you'd get life like that. It would be far more probable for life to form that way than in the way it did. Now, so my, my problem there would be, I mean, like any way that life formed naturalistically would be extremely improbable. So I, I don't know. I don't know. What, what, but, 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 but even so, I mean, I don't, I don't um, even so, I have to this day still not understood um, what the problem there is. And I tend to find myself agreeing with the others who present a, a naturalist position to this. And that, that's why I wanted to reduce it just to the to, the, to, to a smaller scale, looking at planets and uh, you know random objects in the in the universe most of the universe is random chaos emptiness disorder um, it's it's actually very it's actually very interesting that our planet and the the life that you find on this planet is very rare among a massive number of visible chaos and emptiness and randomness um, I would I would be more impressed if I looked out there and uh, and and found that everything that you see out there in the universe is completely meaningful and has complete order and is all all you know going by a certain system. I would be even more impressed if there were letters on planets. I don't know, <laughs> but I, it's it's just no. You wouldn't. It, you it just say me... you you just say oh chance did it. <laughs> <laughs> definitely not but i mean all, all of that i mean just starting from the micro level just makes it uh, makes it very much conceivable to me that randomness chance is what leads you to the state that we are right now and i'm okay with that why would i not be okay with that uh, i haven't studied enough to really grasp why they say this but i think he's saying something similar but on a bigger scale to what he's pointed out in the past with the uh the boltzmann brains argument mm -hmm. namely that if things are just if you have if you've got a multiverse and things are little universes are are randomly forming in this multiverse then you would be you would be massively more likely to form as some little center of consciousness that invents this world and your own consciousness just to keep yourself entertained, that that would be massively more probable than our actually, you know, actual universe forming. And therefore, given the, the probabilities, you should, you should believe that you're the only thing in the universe and that you've just invented all of this to keep yourself entertained. Um, but again, I don't, I, I don't understand why mm -hmm. that's because notice lots of this is like appeal to authority which it's not irrelevant it's they're not irrelevant appeal to authorities some appeals to authority are relevant if you're talking hey this is an expert in this area and, and he says this irrelevant appeals to authority are just like hey this guy uh is an expert in you know insect anatomy and he says that this you know this coffee drink is great okay that's irrelevant you know who who who, who 
cares if he's an expert in bugs or something like that? Um, but you know, Craig is po is pointing out what physicists have claimed. So the point, unless the, you the use point, insects as ingredients in that drink, yeah. yeah. So the the, the uh, which I mean, in the near future, we will. Um, <laughs> So anyway, the point here is, you know, when when Craig is saying, ah, you know, Penrose says this, we don't exactly understand. I don't understand, like, why he's saying that. And so it's 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 kind of taking taking Penrose's word for various things. Um, all right. Should we uh, finish this? We've got 30 seconds left of Craig. Here. Since we do not have such observations, that fact strongly disconfirms the multiverse hypothesis. On atheism, at least, then, it is highly probable that there is no world ensemble. The fine-tuning of the universe is therefore plausibly due neither to physical necessity nor to chance. It therefore follows logically that the best explanation is design. Thus, the teleological argument gives us an intelligent designer of the cosmos. In your face, AP. Okay, here's here's the thing. Maybe I don't understand logic. You right? don't. Maybe maybe you don't I believe don't it. You it. don't believe in logic. You're an atheist. Maybe, <laughs> maybe I don't get it, but I still don't understand. After after years of hearing this, I still don't understand why it would um, therefore logically follow that. Okay, if you say it's the best explanation, I guess you could uh, you could look at it from. He your said something like that. It was weird that he said logically it shows that this is the best explanation is designed. Best explanation, like yeah. That. But... So that's weird because that's you, normally because there it sounds probabilistic, but he says logically, which is different. So yeah, I, don't know. I mean, if you're ruling out the possibilities, if you're saying okay, this is um, very low probability, that is very low probability, uh, this is very low probability, um, therefore the explanation that that intelligence intelligent design is behind this. Um, is much more probable than the others. Therefore, that is the best explanation. If you want to go there, fine. But um, I just, I just wouldn't think that that is on a popular level um, convincing enough to somebody who is actually looking for a reason to believe in God. Uh, so I put up this book, uh, "Fortunate Universe" by Luke Bard. So that's uh, that's the the guy who can't spell except for weird Aussie, <laughs> weird Aussie variations for his Aust. Aust Australiocentric <laughs> view of the world. What I th what I've always thought was a good response to the multiverse stuff, which I didn't catch Craig say there, uh, is that apparently a a multiverse would also have to be finely tuned. In other words, if you got this giant machine that's cranking out these other universes, that that would have to be finely tuned some way. Um, not sure. Not sure. I mean, well, I, I guess I could think why It'd be similar to, I mean, if you have some, if you have a factory that's cranking out other factories, I think you would, yeah, that, that would make sense to be finely tuned. But I, like I find one response to that very fun. I find one response to the whole fine tuning issue very funny, which I also heard from Sean Carroll, which was, I, I, I need to look into that and, and, and uh, expand my mind on that issue a little bit more. But he basically says, why does God need fine tuning anyway? And... <laughs> I want to go. I want to go more in depth on on that just to figure out uh, how he forms that idea. But that's what I call it on the side. <laughs> What's the best argument you've heard for the existence of God? What's the best one? I don't think there are any good ones, but um, the nearest approach to a good one, I think, is the argument of the physicists when they say uh, the universe is fine tuned. Uh, and the, the fundamental constants of physics is sort of half a dozen or so um, numbers which physicists just give us. These, these are constants, and the physicists don't know why they have the values that they do. But physicists have calculated, some, not all, have calculated that if any of these fundamental constants were changed ever so slightly, that would immediately wipe out the universe. You couldn't have, I mean, if you change the gravitational constant slightly, um, matter would not have formed itself into stars, and therefore you wouldn't have got chemistry forming in the interior of stars. You wouldn't have got the elements, and therefore chemistry, therefore you wouldn't have got life. So you have this sort of image of half a dozen knobs that you twiddle um, to raise. So the question before him is, what does he think is the best argument, even granting that he doesn't think any of the arguments are good? What, what, I, find, what I find interesting is he went to fine tuning because uh, Hitchens said that Hitchens said something very similar. Uh, this was I don't remember. Someone was recording them talking in the back of a car, and it was it was oh. 
Hitchens talking to some guy in the back of a car. And that guy was asking about what, what Hitchens thought was the best. And Hitchens said the same thing. And he goes, he said, fine. He said, yeah, the, the, the fine tuning. He goes, there's some, there's something there. There, there, there's, there, there's, there's something where he didn't think there was anything in like, you know, the origin of the universe, like a universe exploding out of nowhere or something like that. Didn't think there was any much to the moral argument or to the argument from uh, bio, design and biology. But anyway, I find it interesting that both these guys point to fine tuning as something a bit stronger than the other than the other points that they read that they reject. Well, I mean, I mean, the issue is it's um, it has a lot of scientific and philosophical elements of um, things that are very hard to comprehend and at the current state, not, um, you know, not not really explicable, which makes it a very, um, very interesting argument for even scientists and even non-theistic philosoph philosophers. But there is also something about it that appeals to, um, you know, the human search for meaning and, you know, human emotions, the, the entire, uh, you would say, I don't know, the, 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 the purpose of humans when questioned is kind of attached to this entire argument as well, because the entire argument implies that things have been put in a specific order in order for you to exist. And that is your meaning. So, you know, it, it, it connects to that very well. It has a very emotional aspect as well. That's why it is so compelling. And it's, at the same time, it is scientifically compelling. It is philosophically compelling. That's why it's so strong. Um, to raise or lower the gain on a particular fundamental constants. And the, there is a, a theistic argument that says, um, because these knobs have all been are all precisely where they have to be in order to give the kind of universe that would give rise to us, there must have been a divine knob twiddler. Probably the best argument I know is still a lousy argument, because, of course, it leaves completely unexplained where the divine knob twiddler himself came from. Um, and th this is what I mean when he he's going to go into this, but... Uh... This is I, kind think, of, I think this is a bad response. Here. Yeah, he's, he's like, this This would be more of a, a response that you could bring up in a to a basic uh, cosmological argument for God, right? Yeah, the, the or, thing, uh, it's, it's like, it's like he, in the, 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 the part that's bothering me here is he says, this isn't a very good argument because, because and now yeah. you're expecting, okay, what's the main reason? If like, and I'm like, if this is the reason, if this is the reason it's a bad argument, then maybe it's a it's a slam dunk argument because your response here is dumb. And what's weird is I would, you know, I'd expect I would Peter Bogosian should know better, right? He should know better. And what what's weird is like I, you know, Hume in the dialogues was was arguing brilliantly, but Hume made the same point. It's like, hey, if you're arguing for design and you leave out the the sort of identity of the designer, you haven't really explained anything. You might as well just stop. And that's the point that that Dawkins. Let, let's go ahead and let him uh, finish his point here, and then we'll we'll we can. You have to have a super natural, superhuman intelligence to know exactly what values to twiddle the knobs to, and if you're going to be allowed to postulate an intelligence right from the start of the universe, then you might as well just postulate the the um, fundamental constants themselves. Um, there are other explanations for the fine. Ah, so th th there you had it. So, and again, he points this out as the problem that you haven't <laughs> identified the knob twiddler and therefore you might as well just stop it. If you're, if you're not going to explain that, you might as well stop with the explanation. At, at, you might as well just stop and say, okay, they're the, you know, there are these constants. That's mm -hmm. the end of the, that's the way they are. That's it. Because if you're just going to say, well, God did it, then you're just saying, well, well, you know, how is that? How is that a better explanation? I mean, I, my, he, I believe he's wrong here, but I, I think that's all he's saying, and I think that's lame. But go ahead. I, my, my response to that is um, I mean, when I when I see that, what I how I respond in my mind to it as I'm hearing it is, um, hey, you know, nice. It's good that you're thinking about who created the creator or who designed designer, but that's not really that's not really the argument here, right? I mean, you you are responding to a different issue that that's a that's a question for a different time and you know th that's a question for what that you could bring up when you talk about the necessity of uh, a creator uh but if you specifically want to argue why 
the you know why the argument from uh, intelligent design or or fine tuning is wrong you would have to explain why that whole idea in and of itself is a weak and lousy idea instead of saying it is a lousy idea because who designed the designer it's just it it, it doesn't it doesn't connect very well in my opinion yeah and, and i think this is i mean you know i i i will i will try in arguments i will I will try to look for flaws in the arguments. Uh, this is not a flaw in the design. I mean, this is not a, a flaw in the argument from fine tuning that you haven't yeah. identified the designer. And just so just so everyone understands what we're talking about here, um, uh, it just imagine just imagine we we send out you know sometime in the future we actually send out a spacecraft and it goes all the way to the Andromeda galaxy and we get to the Andromeda galaxy and suppose you find a planet and there's no life on it but you find something just like like Stonehenge or something like that you would start thinking oh there there was life here at some point there was some sort of intelligent life here even if you had no clue what that life was and you had no remnants if you just found something like stonehenge just some stones piled up in a certain way or if you found pyramids let's say and let's say you had no idea who made those pyramids but you find pyramids there you start thinking okay something made these now let alone if you find something like a cell phone or something there there's something that's comparably uh you know technologically sophisticated even if all life had been wiped out and there was no evidence of life if you found something like a computer or something like that if you were to if you were to find something you would be saying wow this is proof that there was life here that there was intelligence here and if someone like dawkins were there going well, if you're if you're if you're going to say that there's intelligence there uh, without explaining who that intelligence is, then you might as well just stop at the stupid iPhone. That wouldn't make any sense. That would be that would be, that would be ridiculous, right? Even if you even if you realized you had no clue who designed whatever it is we're talking about, even if you had absolutely no clue and no way of knowing, you would still inc you would just conclude, okay, something intelligent made that. We have no, we don't know otherwise what it is, but there is intelligence behind it. Matter of fact, there, there are things like this where uh, this this fell apart eventually. But there was a there was a, a probe that went by Mars, and there was a mountain that looked like it had a face on it, and so it was mm -hmm. it was circling. Ah, aliens made this thing and stuff, and they eventually sent another probe to get better pictures of this to see if it's actually a face. It turns out it was just the way shadows, the thing doesn't look like a face at all. It's just the way some shadows were cast at a certain angle that made it look like a, made it look like a face. But notice the thought would be if you actually found something that's shaped like a face or an alien face on Mars and you took a real close look at it and it, the more it looks like a face, the, the less likely you would think it, it was random. And so uh, anyway, I just think this is an incredibly stupid point that Dawkins is making, that if you want to say something is was designed by an intelligence, you would first have to explain the intelligent designer instead of saying, OK, maybe I don't know anything about the intelligent designer, but it's obvious it's there are obvious signs of design here. Whereby um, multiverse explanation, the universe that we know that can the universe that we can see with our instruments is only one of a very, very large number of universes. Some physicists speak of a bubbling foam of universes. And we're just in one bubble. And each bubble has different values of the fundamental constants. And with hindsight, we, of course, have to be in one of the minority of bubbles that has the fundamental constant set to the right value to give rise to us, because we're here. Right. So it, that, it's, it's the anthropic principle. That, that, that assumes that, and Victor Stenger wrote a, a book about this in The Fallacy of Fine Tuning. Yeah, that, he, he doesn't accept it. Yeah, the, that's the, right. That, yes, yeah. yes. So that... Um, I, I, I'm, 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 I mean, I can't say I'm totally okay with going to multiverse uh, explanations w without good reasons to go with multiverse explanations. Because, I mean, keep in mind, that's a... That's a pretty big pill to swallow there saying, ah, you know, we've got, we've got our universe and then there's this maybe infinite array of alternative universes that we have no access to and they're, they're, they're undetectable and so on. That's a, it's kind of a weird explanation, but someone like Dawkins should not. And to, to be fair, he's not saying this is the way it is. He's saying some people might say, so it's just I'm, I'm pretty sure I remember him uh, saying at some point that uh, he finds it far more unlikely that there is a multiverse. Then, then there is a god or something like that, or, or maybe oh, he was referring to a 
maybe he was referring to a parallel multiverse or I don't know what, what oh, that, that's, exactly. that's, that, that's, ac that's actually good because, uh, I mean, I was thinking if he were to appeal to a multiverse, he would be inconsistent because I've seen him say that, you know, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're, if you're thinking, well, the way the universe is right now, and you sort of, you know, imagine your way back in time, you get to it, you get down to a, you know, a little singularity. Um, so he says, you, you're getting, you're going back to something simpler and simpler and simpler and simpler until you get to a singularity. He goes, why, in order to explain that initial start, would you then appeal to something massively more complicated? And he says this with, with respect to God, like, uh, Hey, if you, once you, once you're down to the singularity, you've got this simple little thing, you're looking for an explanation for, for how this is getting started. Uh, why are you positing something that's, uh, massively more sophisticated than the little singularity, but the same, that same reasoning would apply to a multiverse, right? If you're saying, ah, in order to explain that little singularity and how it's, man, we got this massive, you know, this infinite array of alternative universes, um, so yeah, it would be, I think it would be, he, he would be inconsistent appealing to it. But yeah, if he says he's got a problem with that too, then. I'm not sure if I, if I remember it correctly, but that's what I recall. I'm yeah. pretty sure that he was. Um, I mean, it yeah. would, it would, it would make, it would make sense for him to, to hold that yeah. position, but yeah. 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 All right. That the good. universe is fine tuned for us rather than us being fine tuned to the yes. universe. Um, I think in any case, it, it's, it's one thing to say, um, that if any one of those knobs was, was changed, the whole universe would fall apart. But that doesn't preclude, I suspect, changing more than one. Right. If you change oh, several at once, then you could probably make a very large number of universes. Um, e even the possibility of a multiverse, though, would seem to me to undermine any sort of faith-based notion. I mean, if... if I'll tell you the best argument that, I, that I've heard. The best argument that I've heard is why is there something rather than nothing? Unfortunately, it's also a very poor argument uh, because e either there was something, it's, it's the multiverse theory for one, and, and if there is a multiverse, then that must, by definition, undermine one's confidence that the universe had a beginning and that beginning was God. Well, even if you have a problem deciding how things began, why there's something rather than nothing, how on earth does it help? to postulate an intelligence doing it. I mean, you've, right. it's, it, it's a mystery how things, maybe right. it is a mystery how anything started, but it's a hell of a lot easier to understand how something simple started than something as complicated as a divine intelligence. Right. Um, I mean, he, the, the thing is, I, I don't think, I don't think um, a multiverse would, uh, as a hypothesis, would, would rule out the existence of a creator. Yeah. I mean, it, it's, it's entirely, I don't know, from my, uh, a rudimentary perspective, I would say it is entirely you know, conceivable that there is hypothetically a multiverse you know, of, of, of infinite universes and that there is also a creator for each one of them and a creator for each one of those. I'm, I'm just saying uh, th this is one of the possibilities, you know, hy hypotheticals. Uh, it, it doesn't mean... It doesn't. I, I don't think it can. It puts much doubt. I just see it as an alternative explanation to intelligent design. I disagree with uh, Peter Bogosian right there in, in what he just said about uh, yeah. Well, yeah. If, if you if you've got a multiverse, then, then what do you need? My goodness, if you that that's that's like saying hey, I'm in this room and I think this room needs a builder. So if I said hey, there there's good evidence in this room that this room had a builder. And then I get outside and I see there's a whole city and I go, oh, I guess there doesn't need to be a builder because there's this massive city here. That, 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 would, that would make absolutely, I, I don't know, I think that's stupid. It's like, it's like the, bigger, the, the bigger and more advanced the things are that you're, that you're positing, it doesn't seem to do away with the need for a, uh, for a designer. But as far as, a, and keep in mind, you can have, I, I don't know if anyone argues this, but I assume people do, but I would call it like the theistic multiverse theory, like God creates an infinite array of universes with different properties. In fact, I made a video, I made a video a while back called the multiverse response to the problem of evil. And, uh, I basically argued, okay, look, if you atheists get to appeal to, to, uh, the multiverse, this infinite array of alternative universes in order to explain features of ours, then great. It makes sense if I do it too, but you won't like it. So when you complain about human and animal suffering, perhaps God, and, and say that God should have made a hedonistic paradise, and that's the only sort of world God would create a hedonistic paradise. 
I say, uh, well, maybe God makes an infinite array of different kinds of universes, and maybe the vast majority of them are hedonistic paradises, but he sort of tweaks the properties of different universes to get different results and emphasize different virtues and so on. And so maybe ours is the one where you get a lot of a lot of uh, human and animal suffering because That's God has would... purposes for that. I thought <laughs> Dawkins' response was pretty weak. Yeah, I mean, he put out some of the... Uh, the the basic response in the end there, but it should have been it should have been the main focus in my in my humble opinion, and it should have been more detailed, you know, more focused on that point instead of talking about the the, the creation of the creator. If you leave out the the phrase knob twiddler, <laughs> <laughs> Dawkins actually gives a good summary of what the argument is. Although, as Suskind points out. Um, I mentioned earlier, he says it's actually a couple dozen. It's actually a couple dozen things that have to be finely tuned. He's the one who pointed out some of them, you know, they need to be somewhat precise in that if they varied by 20 or 30 percent, then you'd run into problems. And then he points out that some of them are, are uh, as he puts it, on a razor's edge. Like if you went in either direction, even slightly, things 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 fall apart. And uh, and then he he says, well, his his position is that there's this megaverse, and our we got one part of it, and different uh, different areas are going to have different uh, different properties, and so um, yeah, I, I would say we have actually we have given a very good um, uh, summary and uh, analysis as experts in the field uh, to these questions today, especially me, and yeah, I think the case closed. But by the way, little little little, uh, little side note as I'm uh, as I'm closing out. Uh, so I'm a theist. AP here is a non-theist, but he's the he's the non-angry type. And, and, and there are basically three categories when it comes to topics like this. And I and I, and I saw these back when I was an undergraduate. I double majored in biology and philosophy, so I had to do a uh, I had to do a senior uh, senior project and, and presentation in biology. Which by that time I wasn't terribly interested in. It started off in biology and then took philosophy and then got massively more interested in philosophy. But I still had I was almost finished with my uh, with my uh, uh, biology degree. So for my senior project and presentation, I said, "Hey, I want to do something that actually crosses over with philosophy. So I want to do uh, intelligent intelligent design in uh, in biology." And there were three professors. There was there's the one you have to go to to sort of guide you through your project. And he was a theist. So I went to a Christian. I went to a Christian biology professor. But the other two guys were both atheists. But one was really mad <laughs> that I was talking about intelligent design, even though I'm just like, here, here's the argument and here's some of the responses to it. One guy was like really enraged. And the other guy, who's also an atheist, just you know, sort of found it, you know, the whole thing amusing, but he wasn't angry at all. And I sort of, mm -hmm. I, I sort of saw that like, okay, you've got the theist. He's, he agrees with me. Then you've got the atheist and you've got one atheist who's clearly enraged. And it's like, what are you enraged about that? That an undergrad, <laughs> like some undergrad is talking about design and the possibility of design and biology. You're like enraged. Oh no, I can't, I can't stand that. And then there's the other guy who, Hey, you know, I, I you know, I, I, I don't believe that there's design, but I don't really care if someone thinks that there is or someone argues that there is and so on. But I've noticed there are those three categories in, in all of this for for forever. Like anytime there's an argument for theism, there's there's the theist. Then there's the angry, enraged critic who like is horrified by the thought that anyone would, would look at the universe or look at biology and come to a different conclusion. And then there are the uh, the friendlier people, and, and I'm pointing that out because the three video clips are those three categories. There's William Lane Craig, he's the theist. There's Dawkins, he's more of the angry. Um, he, although he wasn't angry. terrible, he's, he's, he seemed very friendly in that uh, in that clip there. But you know, he's he's pretty hostile towards uh, towards theism. And then Suskind, who uh, you know, I don't I don't see any need. I don't think that prayer changes anything or anything like that. But it doesn't seem but like whatever. it doesn't seem angry that people think there's a there's a fine tuner of the universe. But uh, so we have uh, we have the enraged atheists like AP and uh, and Richard Dawkins, <laughs> and then we have the friendly the friendly atheists like you're just being atheistophobic now. It's terrible. <laughs> Welcome to the atheist bashing show, ladies terrible. and gentlemen. Yeah, terrible. 
We'll catch you next time. And uh, not sure what we're talking about next week, but we'll have more for you next weekend. Unless AP gets lazy. Yeah. So stay away from... Atheism. Something. <laughs> <laughs> catch y'all later.